live, so I'll let you know when we get there. <laughs> Good evening, guys. We are live on the Accidental Journalist Live and Undrugged episode 17. Just turn that down. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, as always, we are uh, sponsored by Armour Scaffolding and uh, No Mean City Clothing. But tonight, uh, I have Hayley Messenger. Uh, on with us. Um, if anything does go wrong like it did last week, we will jump onto Facebook Live. Uh, okay. Haley is a former criminal um, who happens to have Tourette's. Um, she yeah. informed me that she has physical <laughs> and motor. Um, uh, what's the word? Motor and vocal tics. tics. Yeah, and I yeah, do um, swear occasionally. I'll try not to. That's that's fine, and it's okay no to, <laughs> and it's okay to laugh. Uh, yeah, so, you got to. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, thanks for coming on. Um, Thank you for having me. Let's let's let's. I like to take my guests back to the start. Uh -huh. so let's go back to your um, far as we can back to your childhood and. <laughs> yeah, um. Well, um, I I. I grew up in Essex, a small little town, um, lovely little place, really. Um, I've always had quite a sort of, I've always felt out of place. But it's just from all, from ever since I can remember, I've never felt like I've fitted in. I suppose having bright ginger hair and Tourette syndrome never really helped the situation whatsoever. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was quite, it was quite nice, but I was always a complete pain in the backside, always, um, my poor mum and dad. And then at about seven years old, um, when my Tourette's started, and it started quite severely, I also found out that my dad wasn't my biological dad, um, which just rocked me to my core. The same year I lost my granddad and we were really close, me, my nan and my granddad. And yeah, it, it just felt like everything had fallen apart. And I think when I can look back now, I can see I sort of was sabotaging that. But mm. at the time, you, you don't think, oh, he adopted me because he wanted to. You know, you sit there and think as a child, from a child's perspective, you know, I don't belong to this family, you know, and my birth father, he was a criminal also. So I sort of wonder if it was sort of back in my head, do I emulate him? Do, do you know what I mean? I put him on a pedestal and yeah, it, things were difficult. Yeah, things were very difficult. Um, I had ADHD also. Um, so I was a complete and utter live wire. Um, yeah, I was shouting, swearing and running about and getting lost, <laughs> just, just into havoc, really. So, yeah, I didn't have sort of normalish friends. I always gravitated towards the outsiders, you know, and I think then that always becomes an issue, especially heading towards my teens. And that in my teens, I really went sort of crazy and up the wall, really. Um, but apart from that, it you know, my mum and my dad were really lovely, and I've got a sister as well. Um, but I just wanted, I was so jealous of my younger sister. I, I just wanted to be her. She was beautiful, you know, perfect at school, you know. She was um, my dad's real daughter. And yeah, I think that's all I wanted. Yeah, so that was, yeah, that was quite sort of hard. Going mm. into my sort of teens, um, yeah, I, I just didn't play ball whatsoever. School was a complete and utter issue for me. 
I mean, I, I was with my Tourette syndrome, especially, they didn't know what it was. My mum kept taking me to doctors, psychiatrists, and the, no, I mean, considering Giles de la Tourette, I think, diagnosed it in 1870 or something, mm. the doctors know very, very little about it. I mean, I think one GP said they spend half out of their 10 year sort of thing as a doctor, they spend sort of one morning on sort of odd different conditions. So I mean, mm. doctors, I'm probably more of a specialist than my local GP, you know, on that. So obviously that was really hard. So we got, we got no help there. And <laughs> it, it was a nightmare because my mum used to take me and um, with Tourette syndrome, it, 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 it's like, and how do I explain it? Right. It's like having a really naughty little monster inside you that's just bursting to get out, right? And you have to sort of hide it and try and pull it in. But now and again, if you haven't got the eye on the ball, it will just burst out, usually at the worst, most inappropriate moments. It, it's just, <coughs> sorry, the dog's going now, the dog's going outside. Shut up. And, um, yeah, oh, talking of bursting out at the wrong moment, got the dog. Um, so, yeah, it, I'm so sorry. Um, so, yeah, um, shut up. Come on. Come on. It's only another dog. Come on. Yeah, so they, she used to take me to the doctor or the psychiatrist, and I used to be silent. And she'd be like, why on earth aren't you making a noise or anything? And I'd come out of there and I'd be back to my ticky self, swearing at random people and stuff. And um, yeah, it was, it was really quite difficult. School, um, yeah, that didn't work well at all. I was incredibly bright, but it was just getting me to stay in the one place yeah. to learn. Do you know what I mean? Um, I mean, in the end, they used to lock me in the French cupboard. I was like a Parisian Harry Potter. Do you know what I mean? That's why I can read French. I can't speak it. Mm -hmm. I tried the other day and I think I said something along like, I've lost the dog she looks like or something when I was supposed to say like, how are you and something else. It, my accent don't help. She always said that, you know, I sound like um, Del Boy with my Essex accent with it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Terrible. But yeah, it, it just didn't go well. So I stopped attending, um, used to hang out with all the lads. I found that most lads would accept me more than the girls would and would just go off and just cause havoc, you know. And obviously with that, you know, falls into smoking drugs and, you know, like weed, where it was solid back then. Um, yeah. Um, well. Yeah, you know, when it it was fifteen pounds for an eight, everyone had to chip in, and um, yeah, so I sort of, I thought, well, this ain't gonna work for me. What is? So yeah, I started dealing, and I started dealing quite young. Um, I used to deal ease when I was fifteen, and I used to. They were the days without a mo. Well, mobile phones were about, but. They were like the bricks, do you know what I mean? So I used to sit outside our local police station on a Friday evening <laughs> and get rid of my ease. And everyone was like, you're crazy. And I'm like, well, that's the last place they're going to expect you to sit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it touch wood, it works. <laughs> so, yeah, we I got into that quite early. Um, and, yeah, just I was just an utter pain pretty uncontrollable I got a boyfriend that was a lot older than me he was 21 um and then I went through the raving and all of that sneaking out going to parties and yeah eventually then I was pregnant at 16 but before I knew I was pregnant I got thrown out by my mum and I moved into NAPRO accommodation right um yeah it, it was for single homeless as well and I shared a home with um my mate Kai 
he wasn't a mate at the time. He was so suspicious of me. Mm. But he was quite um, a well-known criminal in our area. And, um, yeah, we never had a front door. It was always gone. It, it, yeah, and he sort of... Gelling up with him didn't help my situation whatsoever. You know, I learnt lots of tricks of the trade, <laughs> especially to do with cars and things. Um, but obviously I was pregnant. I moved out into mother and baby unit because of my age. I wasn't old enough to hold a lease. He went off to prison. And um, yeah, I had my son and yeah, he, he, it was amazing. It had completely changed me and brought me round. It, you know, it was fabulous. And then what I'd done, I, yeah, I think for a few years, I felt whole and I felt solid. And yeah, after that, I don't know quite, I don't know quite what went wrong. I got a brilliant job. I used to work with the youth offending team with first time offenders. And we used to do these, um, I've forgotten what they're called, sorry, my mind's gone blank. Um, we used to do these things that they were sentenced to and it'd be part reparation and then it would be part of something good, something for them to feel good about themselves. And going on from then, um, I applied for a job in a children's home with a secure unit, but I absolutely hated the secure part. And at 21, I just turned 21, I got I got the job and I was up, I was with like 15 other people, you know, qualified social workers, probation officers, ex-police officers, and they chose me, this, you know, person that had dropped out of school, mm. no GCSEs, was like pain in the arse, a criminal, you know, and they chose me. And I, you know, it was amazing. It felt so good. And I, I didn't even see that as a job, you know. I, I, I loved doing that so much. And the kids were great. And, yeah, I was just brilliant at it for such a long time. I think what then happened... Um, I hooked up with old friends. I'm not going to put the heat on them, no. but you know that old thing. Yeah, you kind of get involved with them, and yeah, it sort of all sort of fe fell apart. Really, I think as well, I'd lost some of my childhood where I was a mum at sixteen. You know, so I sort of deviated back a lot of what I was hearing from these children though was horrific abuse mm. and it was that feelings of loss and not having that family and I think it had unnerved stuff in me to do with my own childhood and not fitting in and not having that ideal family you know or what I thought was ideal um yeah and then we started getting into drugs again. Apart from this time, it wasn't solid and ease and whiz. It was heroin and crack. And, yeah, that that just tore the arse out of my world, yeah. really. It was, yeah, it was horrific. I carried on doing that job still as an addict, which I know is awful. But, you know, you just try and hold your world together don't you in whatever way you can you think you're yeah, all right no to function. yeah yeah and it's yeah it was all just falling apart at the seams but you're so blinkered by what's going on you think that you're doing all right but really I, I really weren't I was an absolute mess and um I met my um long-term boyfriend Ian and um, yeah, started using more and more and more. And he then got put away. Um, but basically we were doing odd bits on the side. I mean, I was clearing sort of 1,500 a month 
and that was gone. And we were doing crime on the side, mm. still to pay for our habits and, you know. And I mean, this was horrific. I remember one night, I'll never, I'll never forget this, I had to take a kid to the police station. Oh, don't, it's awful. I had to take this poor kid to a police station. And while we were waiting in there, I thought, shit, I've got it in my back. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be about to be locked in a cell with this kid because they self-harm. So we used to go in with them. And I've got shit on me. Like, do you know what I mean? I'm thinking, oh my God, but they didn't search me. Well, anyway, on the way out, this kid had gone, oh my God, look at that person on the wall. It looks like you. And it was. I mean, this is how, how I was really cutting it fine. It, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't good at all. And um, yeah, me and Ian were doing ridiculous things. I mean, we blew up someone's car once because someone owed him money, it, you know, just really on the top, not thinking about how bad and how dangerous it, it, it was, you know, and he got locked up and he asked me to bring it in. And that's when, yeah, things really took a turn for the worse. The first time I went, I completely bottled it. I'd done it years before for my friend Kai, but I was kind of put on the spot right at that minute when his girlfriend had like said, I can't do this. And I thought, well, we've got to do it. We're, we're in the middle of the prison now. So I'd take it and I'd do it. But this was me doing it on my own, knowing from the start. So I remember I bottled it the first time. And I remember him coming on the visit and saying, I can't believe you've let me down like this. And I'm a person that I don't let people down. And that, he could have stabbed me with that sort of info. That really hurt. Do you know what I mean? So I booked a visit about three days later. Um, took it in oh, there was one other person that knew I was going in with it and as I went in I was number 13 ironically yeah so it is an unlucky number believe me and yeah I'd been grassed up they didn't even let me get into the visit um and I had CID waiting upstairs for me yeah i honest to god they put they said right come through and they put me in a little room and i just thought what am i gonna do and i had these screws looking at me and i was thinking how on earth am i gonna like put this up sort of thing and i was like i'm just i'm done for here so when they took their eyes off me to look at cid i tried doing it didn't work they just literally grabbed me out by my legs leg restraints I was like a turkey and um, yeah done for I was done for taking an eighth of heroin yeah and they let me they let me have bail but that's because I hadn't been caught for anything else I'd done and obviously it had to be tested so yeah I was bailed but obviously I went guilty and yeah I was sentenced to two yeah two years two years I was sentenced which was extremely lucky I, I was looking at about a seven I was told don't be surprised that you're not gonna you, you know you could get it and mm. yeah um from that from that from that night in the police station I just lost everything I got worse on what I was taking um I started using needles instead of um, smoking it. I'd just given up on life myself completely, really. Um, yeah, I'd given up even to the point where I was no good for my son anymore and had to leave him with my mum because I was just crap, you know? And the guilt I feel about doing that you know, but guilt eats at you and guilt will make you use. So you have got, isn't it? So you have got to try and hold that back and just think, well, I'm better now. 
you know. But I know it's still hard for him to mm. take hold and that, you know, he, he still hasn't forgiven me totally and I really don't blame him, you know. But, yeah, but, yeah, I was doing crazy things, getting involved with stupid people. I mean, some of the people I was involved with, I remember one stupid thing. He was quite a big dealer. And um, I'd got in his car and he said, right, will you watch the car while I go into the shop? He said, can you get me the key out the glove box? I was like, all right. So I'm looking. When he gets back in the car, I said, there ain't one in there. He went, what? What were you on about? And was like really panicking. He went, it's there. I thought he meant a bloody door key. This is how I'm naive <laughs> I was. You know, he was on about key key. Yeah. So, yeah, he... So then I started running for him because places he was going, he wanted sort of, at the time, I looked a fairly sort of normalish, all right, sort of good white girl, not to be pulled over. Mm. So, yeah, I've done a lot of running for him, which, you know, I was on bail. That would have made things 10 times worse if I'd have got caught. And then my partner, Ian, come out and we just, yeah, hit it hard we moved away we went to Romford and yeah it was just just craziness we done stupid things quite heavy with them up until the time I was going to go away and yeah I weren't going to hand myself in at all and he was like you need to do this because if when they take you, you're guaranteed you're not going to have a penny in your pocket, you know, so go on, do it. So he gave me a big parcel, which I was reluctant to even take with me, but I did, and I'm glad I did. Um, mm. But, yeah, court was a nightmare. The, they didn't, they did <laughs> Where I was so nervous, my threats was that bad. I kept sitting, like, I've got a terrible thing stick my finger up at people it's a nightmare um so I kept doing it at the judge and he's looking at me like are you serious and the group four bloke next to me is like you're off your head are you do you want more years or something I'm like Rrr. and um, yeah it, I was so bad and I'm trying to pay attention to what this man is saying but just nothing you know my brain was going too fast and he um I had to ask when I was downstairs how long I'd got. And um, yeah, it weren't good. So yeah, off to Holloway we went, which was, yeah, a nightmare. And um, yeah, when I got there with Tourette's as well, you say the most inappropriate things all the time. Like I'm not racist whatsoever, but saying that N word, is a part of it. It's like you're constantly flirting with what's appropriate and what's not. You know, like think like at funerals, I laugh, not because I find it funny, but because it's the worst thing you can do. If someone gives me a gift, what I usually do is this, which, you know, is so effective. And it's not because I don't like the gift. It's, you know, it makes me do it. And I'm like, why? But, yeah, so I had to try and explain. I think there were seven tables when I got into Holloway and they were either black or Asian. And I had to try and explain to them that I'm not a racist, but I may shout, swear, and, you know, say the N-word. And it was just awful. They didn't understand what I meant at all. Mm. So they put me down as a racist. And in Holloway, it's usually four dorms, four per person dorms. And I got put in a double, which is very rare in there. But I was on my own. And um, yeah, I remember going in there and thinking, what on earth have I done? You know, it, what on earth have you done? I mean, a lot of it, you, you can't remember, you know, you block it out, don't you? Or you just live in that haze. And yeah. It's, yeah. 
it's horrible it's horrible and I remember going in there and just I didn't even have a pillow I got on the buzzer and I got bollocked for that one you know and I'm like well I don't know how this thing works and I didn't even have a lighter to get my parcel out and do anything mm. so I remember being so and I was so scared to get it out as well you know and I was like oh my god oh my god at every creek and then yeah I just wouldn't come out the cell I'm not I'm not I'm not afraid to admit uh, you know I just burst into tears I was like that for about a good 24 hours you know you just feel like how low have I become you know it's and you know that sort of moment between sleep and when you do, when you just wake up but you're not quite fully awake yeah. and then you think oh I must be at home and you saw it, see those bricks and you think, oh, fuck, you know. Do you, you, do you know what I mean? And then it's like, Ugh, all again. Mm. And, yeah, one of the officers, she, she thought, no, nah, this is doing me no good. And she put sort of an old lag to it in with me, named Billy, and she was amazing. She was really good. She sort of pulled me out of myself, you know, I mean, I suppose it helped that I had a parcel too, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, that that sort of put the eyes in on it. But um, yeah, she taught me a lot actually, because I was starving myself. You know, that's been a theme through my life also, sort of the self harm, you know, yeah. and not feeling quite right and like I fit in or things like that, like I used to be bulimic. And that started again in prison. And she was like, it doesn't matter if you keep doing this. Because when I went into prison, I weighed seven stone nine, which was horrifically underweight for me, really mm -hmm. underweight. My ideal weight's 10, 10. And I was, yes, yeah, so I was having build up drinks and that. But in my screwed up little mind, I thought, well, if I'm that ill, I'll go to hospital <laughs> and then I'm out. But obviously it doesn't work like that. They patch you up and send you back. Do you know what I mean? That's if you get out to an hospital at all. Yeah. So, yeah, she was she was my rock. She was amazing. She was a good girl. But, yeah, Tourette's is hard when you're in prison. Um, I mean, especially coming off everything, which it had dampened down everything, it's suddenly big again, do you know what I mean, and more violent. So I was getting nickings for swearing at staff, like whacking staff in the head, other girls, you know, I was like jumping up and down the wing. It was horrific, like, <laughs> honest to God, I mean, I only spent a few weeks there and then I got sent to Peterborough, um, which was like, it, it, that was a better move. And um, four of us went there and um, it was mainly a load of Northern girls at the time and out come all the Essex girl jokes and, do you know what I mean, which my friends didn't take particular, you know, happy with. And um, yeah, flipped all the tables over at dinner. And I knew oh, it was just carnage. I'll never forget it. Sweet and sour chicken and trifle for after. And it was everywhere. We were being bent up and by the screws and that we were just covered from head to toe and all this just crap. And that, that just set it off then. I just thought, oh, I just wanted to get this done, be good. But yeah, it didn't quite pan out like that. I said, that was the beginning of it really they got ragged mm -hmm. off the wing after that one and I got left there with a group of women that didn't really understand why I was really rude to people and also why I'd sort of trashed all their dinner the first night I'd come so yeah it was really really hard they used to take the piss quite a lot as well but I've got broad shoulders so I could take it. But in the end, I did make quite a few good friends, you know. 
Um, but yeah, some of the officers really didn't like me and I'd be taken down to see the governor quite often until he was basically sick of seeing me. And then, then in a way I did use it, you know, that was, well, I might as well, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I get given this awful thing. I might as well use it to annoy people as well. So it was a bonus slightly, so I can't say it well. Hmm. So, yeah. Um, and, but I did have two girls who were horrific to me there. The bullying they done was just astronomical. Do you know what I mean? And I think in the end, you lose it. And I happened to lose it by the hot water run which weren't one of the best things, and I jugged both of them, which, you know, I don't want to hurt people. I don't yeah. want to do stuff like that, you know? And, yeah, I, I, I got quite dumb to that one. Weren't good whatsoever. But I was still with Ian throughout my sentiment, <clears throat> but I was coming to the realisation that if we didn't sort our lives out, we were going to die. You know, so I put myself down for the rat course and I got put in HMP Send in Surrey. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it was one of the best courses I've done. It <laughs> it was yeah, it was it was brilliant. It you know, it it helped me to look inside myself and figure out what is missing, what made me tick, you know, why I do what I do, you know, and ultimately stop blaming it on this, that and the other, you know, and take responsibility for yourself, you know. And, yeah, it, it was hard. It was really hard. And it didn't help that within the first week of being there, my cellmate who come with me, it was from Peterborough overnight to send. And she she come with me. I weirdly enough, this didn't help whatsoever. Two girls in the van my sister went to school with. So they knew me, which didn't help. So everyone thought I was a grass, because these two girls on the bus know me intimately from being little so that weren't good well anyway we sorted that issue out but she she was only doing it so that she could get her parole yeah. it wasn't it wasn't a thing for her to make her well in herself which you know you can't do that sort of course and it disrupts anyone else you know who does it and she she got it smuggled in but what she didn't realize was you know, by telling me and by she put that on me, I was in there for the same as well. So anyway, I told her, if you're going to do it, do it after you're on lockdown because you're locked on spurs there, not like regular cells. But she wouldn't. She'd done it before dinner. You're on a, you know, you're on a wing with a load of addicts. You can tell when someone's done it, you know. So she got tested, she come up positive. We all had group meeting and they said, does anyone else know it was coming in? She went, yeah, Hayley did. And I thought, you bitch. And I thought, do you know what? And the counsellor said to me, you know, obviously I hadn't taken it. So, you know, thank God I, I was all right. But they said if that had been any other part of the prison, I'd have been up for supplying again, you know, which second time round, Christ, I don't know what I'd be looking at, you know, not good whatsoever. But I, anyway, they put me on a lay down for two weeks to just think about things. And I completed that and got out. And within, Five hours, Ian was already out. I was using again, and I just cannot believe I struggled through all of that to then get exactly back to square one, you know. 
and it had just gone tits up. I don't know why I'd sort of, I must have known in my own head that's where I was going. I don't think Ian was in the same space as I was, you know, and then obviously us getting out more or less at the same. He was about a month and a half before me. It, you know, it didn't work. And he was using by the time I got out. I was, I thought that would be okay. I thought I'd be fine with that. I'd be able to leave it. Doesn't work like that. You know, you've got to literally cut everyone, haven't you? You know, and that's and that's a job in itself. It is, it is. I, 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 I think that um, people don't appreciate how hard it is. Yeah. I think that you could just, you know, once you've gone cold turkey, that's it. The, the, the thing that, that, you know, it's, yeah. it's not that simple. And, you know, it's a very, addiction is a very deceptive disease. disease. Not only yeah. does it make you deceive other people, but it makes you deceive yourself. Yeah, and, and you don't know when it's going to come up, and, and you think, "Oh, I'll be all right, I'll be all right, I'll be all right." And by yeah. the time it, it you, you know, you, you know anything, you, you you sat in a crack house or a yeah, Mac Den, and and, and you you're puffing away. So yeah, you, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I really feel you there. Yeah, it's it, uh, and I just and I, and I think as well, you you get that mentality of, fine, I've done it now rather than thinking that's a blip put that behind you move on you sort of sabotage yourself and like you say I, I probably was deceiving myself and thought Ray fuck it that's you know free reign now let's go back on it which I did at full bloody force again you know which weren't good but instead of doing you know it in the proper way we we started dealing big amounts, um, which, yeah, weren't good whatsoever. My son moved back in with me. Um, me and Ian got a house together. And yeah, we, we were dealing to my little town round here. Um, and we were constantly having the door, we were getting stopped, having the car search. One month we had 22 stop and searches on the vehicle and they were the only ones that were given paper so it would have been more um we had the door took off you know and then three months to the date of that one door took off again but that the police had said the crime rate in this town has gone through the roof they'd sort of allowed it i think as much as i can say allowed it when we were just serving up heroin it's when we added the crack, I think, to sell. That's when, you know, they were like, mm -mm, no way. So, yeah, we got pulled in for that. Luckily, we were all right, managed to hide what we could. But on the second time, I was still on licence. <laughs> so Ian took it. And obviously, he went away again for a small period of time, but that just didn't stop me. You know, addiction, you just, you know, it's like bugger everyone else and, you know, their needs and what they, you know, even my son, you know, uh, he shouldn't have been having to put up with the house raided, you know, his shell of a parent, you know, they're in body, but in mind and spirit not, you know. Um, so yeah, carried on, just carried on doing it. But you know, Ian just brought craziness into my life, and I loved him very, very much. But I think as well, when I look back now, I think it was we were very codependent on each other. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, Dangerous. yeah, which um, because there's times I've got clean after that but Ian had stayed on but obviously I've then gravitated back because I hadn't removed all the dangers from my life you know which mm. you know um, it's such such a hard thing to do 
And I don't think they warn you about that and how isolating it is. You know, even now, I don't know if you feel like this. Like, <clears throat> I'm clean now, and I have been for years, but do, I don't know if you feel like this. Do you feel as though you don't fit into sort of any particular group? I don't fit into a using group because I'm not a user, but I don't fit into the sort of mums at the school sort of group because I, I, I've led a completely different life there. I feel like I'm in purgatory in a way. Yeah, I, 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 I can identify with that, you know. Um... I think for me, um, like like you said at the start of your story, um, it, you, you know you felt um, you didn't feel part of it because your dad wasn't your real dad. Yeah, you know, I'm adopted, so I know, I know exactly what that feels. Yeah, like. and I've spent my life on the fringes of different people in different groups. So yeah, even when I was using, I was more of a solitary user because. I just, I, people, when I'm vulnerable, yeah, I'm vulnerable. And when I'm feeling strong, I'm feeling strong. Yeah. You know, there are people that will exploit, excuse me, exploit that weakness. Definitely. Um, you know, I, yeah. I, I lived in a town, well, a city um, that is deeply connected to county lines. So I, right. I was deeply vulnerable in around these people. So I never felt like a part of it. I never felt like a part of any group. I was always on the outside, on the fringes. Yeah. And even now that I don't use, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I'm clean and and there, but for the grace of God, I, I you know, I'm coming up to seven years. Yeah. Um, it's still, you know, you don't always feel part of a group, but you know. I've got yeah. a great church. I've got a great family, you know. Yeah. I've got a great community, but uh, and I'm involved, as you know, on Facebook with yeah. a lot of other people who have similar stories. Yeah. And that's great to sort of be in that. Gain your strength and. Yeah, it's, it's 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 great to be in that sort of group, but I still feel that I'm on the outside. Yeah. You know, I, with the podcast, I don't fit in with the podcast because I do it. Li not only do I do it live, but uh -huh. I don't do it on YouTube. I do it on Facebook uh -huh. um, and then it goes on to my website. So, you know, and I, I haven't got a genre, so I don't fit in with a genre. I'm not true crime. I'm not, you know, so, yeah, I know exactly. I love mean. that, though. I love that. I think, obviously, as time goes on, I think, you know, you become more comfortable in yourself and that's just the way it's going to be. But I think addiction, you know, you open up this horrible door that can never, ever be shut or never, ever be properly filled. You know, it's always sort of that bit open, isn't it? Mm. You know, and I think you've mm. just got to learn to live with that. But um, yeah, it's it was hard, and I've I've seen so many friends die, you know, through it. And you know, there was my friend Sheila, um, and then there was Jay, our mine and Ian's friend Jay. He'd been out of prison twenty four hours, and I'm so glad I told Ian not to serve him up because I don't think I could have lived with myself because he OD'd and died. And the police were horrific. We found him. Um, and the police just, the disdain for the man. Yeah, he'd, he was pulled in on a murder charge and he'd got away with it down to disposal of a body. Um, you know, but just the utter disgust and they had for him and the way they were speaking about him you know it was it was horrific and then my friend Sheila um, another dealer who actually found her called me because he knew that one she was my friend and two I was known to the police for dealing mm -hmm. so 
put the dairy on me basically right. you know but anyway mm. me and um ian i i come off um it was a long road it took you know and that was when ian was away ian got sent away on a six-year sentence um i'd come off just before and i think because we were so codependent i think you know that it worked but then I'd, I'd fallen pregnant obviously because obviously well, I don't want to be discussing but you know mm. your lady parts don't work the way they should when you're quite a heavy user yeah. but obviously when you come off they do mm. but you sort of forget this and um yeah I was blessed with my um eight-year-old well he's eight now um yeah I was pregnant and he got sent away and I just made those changes that, yeah, I'm going to do it. And it, it worked, but it split me and Ian so far apart, you know. And, yeah, everything was going quite well and, you know, but we decided to give it another go. And, yeah, I got back on it again, but that was a small blip and yeah we split for good and yeah after that yeah i made it you know it was so hard and i remember the day i actually made it i still had an eight in my pocket you know and i just thought what am i doing i can't do this anymore i just can't you know so i could have carried on i had it there to do and i just thought i cannot do this anymore and I just prayed for God to help me in some way and I don't know what happened but something broke in me something changed you know and I managed to get through it and you know and that was great yeah. but it's, it's been a hard road I think right. putting those relationships back together that you would totally destroyed is the hardest i still think you know like my parents find it hard you know about yeah you know they they do find it hard still i don't think they're completely trusting on it you know and i'll always be the black sheep really <laughs> been to prison and yeah really <laughs> every family's got to have one do you know what i mean it's like a creepy uncle you've got to have one of them i'm sure it's the law mm. and um but yeah it's you know it's just about putting all that back together again and trying to make the best you can yeah. without that guilt i mean i've got a friend Louie, who lived in the flats with me and ian and he was an alcoholic and he was quite bad and he used to be a little gem he used to hide our stuff for us if the police come because he had a better view where he was but we come off at the same time he come off alcohol and i come off heroin and yeah he was you know he's been invaluable you know to both of us actually you know we've spoke throughout and he's still clean he has mm. been for years and you know it's been yeah we've got there but i mean um jamie's dad ian he come out of prison again um not last year the year before um he was out for three months he moved up north this time um to hopefully get away and he did he stayed clean for a while and then on the 24th of february last year he died he od'd and died which <clears throat> I'm guided about, but that's what I mean. It's just evil. That's 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 not easy to deal with, especially no. when you're sort of dealing with your own, you know, um, insecurities as a yeah as a so as a recovering addict as a as a sober person, and then for that to happen, you know, yeah. th these these things happen. Um, bad things happen when we're sober, but it's how yeah. to deal with it. And to be able to deal with it 
and not use. Yeah. So I, I don't think people put enough emphasis on yeah. how difficult that is and yeah. how much that needs to be applauded because it, it, oh, it's, just, it's, it's, it's so difficult to do that. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been there, I've, you know, I, I've lost family over the past <laughs> few years. You yeah. know, I, I lost my biological mum to cancer. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Me, so, you know, and the, the, you know the, these things happen. Um, yeah. But I've not used. Yeah. And when you talked about prayer, that's 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 what happened to me. You know, sat sat in that. Yeah. Sat sat in that house on that floor with, with you, you know, with that pipe and yeah. saying, "God, you know, I don't even know if you exist, but you yeah, know, if if you do." Please take this thirst away from me. Please take this yeah. hunger away from me. And then I fell asleep. And then when I woke up, I haven't used since. But wow. You know, but there for the grace of God. But yeah. it's not that I don't get the thoughts. It's I don't yeah. act on the thoughts. And to not act on those thoughts is just it, yeah. It's, it's difficult. It's it's so difficult. So you know, I'm I'm with you there. Um, you know, it's it it takes a lot of guts. Yeah. Gives me and determination to to get through that. And yeah, more, more power than we've ever had in our lives. Um, you know, and how you're dealing with it is is a, a, absolutely the right way to do it. Thank Just you. Grief, shame, yeah, unforgiveness. These yeah. things are poison to us, and it is, you know, when we have these things, it's like drinking poison and expecting another person to die. But these yeah. things are all part of that self. That self hate, that self hurt, that self sabotage, yeah. and we do it. And it's only by working a program, it's only by using God as we understand Him, hit, uh, yeah. that we can, you know, Evolve. live a relatively normal life. Yeah. But, I, you know, I, I, grief, I found, I found this really hard to. I've never had to deal with this, you know, like you say, with a sober head on. So it, it rocked me to my core, you know. It, it really, really did. And I hated him as well, you know, for doing it, which, you know, he was sick too. So I can't, you know, hate him too much. That could have been me, you know, a few years before. But yeah, I've I'm coming to terms with it more and more. But I'm just gutted that, you know, this disease has taken the dad away from my son. He'll never know, you know, although his dad was a pain in the arse and probably a six police, and the Greater Manchester police are probably really quite chuffed that he's gone, you know, and he's probably saved a fortune in the prison system. But he was an excellent guy. He was an amazing guy, you know, and he was funny. And, you know, and he won't know that. So it is, it is sad, really. It is really sad because the one thing that, or one of the things that addiction does to us is it robs us of identity, of yeah. who we are. You know, I, I became an addict quite young. Yeah. So I've always struggled with mental illness and addiction and, yeah. and, and these you know, difficult thoughts. I've always been the black sheep of the family because I was adopted. And yeah. And family out there that really didn't understand. Yeah. Um, you know, so I had my ways to deal with it. But doing yeah. that at such a young age, I didn't know who I was. I didn't have that chance to find out who I was. So I became a sort of parody of myself. I became the lies that I told. I became the people yeah. that I pretended to be. So for a lot of years, even though I spent 12 years uh, sober, I didn't, well, dry, I would say, I didn't know who I was. And it's only yeah. through these past seven years, <coughs> looking into, you know, brain damage as well, but looking into actually working a program, looking into my own mind, um, pulling these things down, looking at events, um, looking at things that affected me, why they affected me, how they affected me, um, and really sort of working on myself 
that yeah. I've been able to stay clean and, and, and stay sober. And not that it's been easy because it's been hard at times. Um, yeah. You know, um, but it's, we, when we come off drugs, when we come off drink, whatever, I know there are people that don't think that we can change. We can. Yeah. There is a. But I think their doubt doesn't help. Because, do you know what I mean? If you haven't got that support or that belief around you, you know, again, that horrible addict in you feels, oh, what's the point? You know, it's, it's a bit like that stroppy, you know, that Kevin, the teenager, that Harry Enfield yeah. does. Like, oh, for God's sake. Do you know what I mean? You feel like that, yes. don't you? And you just collapse. You, you, you do, but at, at the end of the day... The way I look at it now is, uh, like I said to you earlier, you know what what other people think of us is none of our business. Yeah, you know, it's nice if people think positive things about us, and it's yeah. not so nice if people think negative things about us. But yeah. really, neither of them are no. any of our business. What we've got yeah. to realise is that um, one of the things that we always did when we were using was try and please other people yeah you know it's why we said yes a lot yeah you know we tried to please other people and you know even in sobriety we tried to please other people we tried to do it for other people i tried to stop for my daughter and i love my daughter is yeah. my absolute world um but you know because i wasn't working a program and because i yeah you know, and I knew it. I've been around like the twelve-step program since nineteen ninety-two, nineteen ninety-one, nineteen ninety-two. Oh wow! Been for a long, long time. Yeah, you know, I'm forty-four years old this year. Uh huh. So I, I, you know, I know the program. I know how to work it, but I didn't. Yeah, it's working it though, isn't it? It's you know yeah, exactly. But I would see other people and I would mimic what they were doing. Yeah. And how they were acting, but I wouldn't work the program. Yeah, and you can't. There is no shortcut. No, uh, you know, um, and working a program is is hard work. But we be, we become that ident that identity that we were robbed of. We then start yeah. building and getting back. So we've gone from yeah. the victims of our own circumstance, yeah, to the survivors of the happenstance of the things that happened. So the yeah. next logical step is thrivership to thrive. And that's yeah. what we're doing now by educating, by talking, yeah. by sharing your story. Because we can only get to keep what we have yeah. by giving it away. You know, uh, and it, this this sort of speaking isn't for everybody. Not everybody wants to do it. The amount of times I've been turned down, uh, and I don't blame them. You know, not everybody yeah. wants to do it because we all work a program in a different way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my belief is that we can only get to keep what we have by giving it away. Um, I do. Years, there's been so much wisdom from people, so that, much love. You're right. You've got to give that back. Because I mean, I, I've had people like in um, the drug place. I mean, I've done voluntary work there when I was getting clean myself. But some of you know, just like little comments people would say, or they'd go out their way to ring you you know, on a really difficult day or something that you're doing, mm. you know, just just that little thing and that little bit of belief made that a better day, made that a day that you didn't go back to crime and using and, you know, and that is a massive thing. It may be a little thing for them or anyone might think, oh, well, that's my call. But for me, that was the difference between going back and like you say trying to thrive so I believe you need to talk about it and help wherever you can do you know what mm. I mean and sometimes it's just down to validation because we yeah. need to you know we not only need to tell people but we need to be sometimes need to be told that actually you are, the way that you are feeling um, you know um, that's valid yeah. And you are right to feel like that. 
when so many times we're told to stop living on our own drama or to man up or to you know yeah. uh, suck it up, princess. You know, it's you know, we we the the, the thing about using or quitting using is that when we're using we have you know our, our feelings they can go away yeah um you know uh, and we lose we, we kind of lose our emotion so when we stop you know the great thing about getting clean is getting our emotions back but that's all that's all the worst thing that's a double-edged sword we've that, been robbed it? of it for years yeah so we don't know how to deal with it no that's and right that's how so many people fall yeah it's it is a hard one and like you say it's a daily it's a daily sort of thing you've got to keep yourself in check and keep looking at where you are and you know where you're going but yeah we'll get there <laughs> well, how are you dealing with it in 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 the pandemic Do you, are you working the 12-step program are you no, um, I'm, I've sort of, well, to be honest, since Ian went, I literally had a breakdown. I also had my son who's got autism and he's got sensory processing disorder. My youngest is eight um, and he's got um, Tourette's syndrome too. He mm -hmm. has been, he, he got um, expelled from two schools before like before lockdown the first lockdown had happened um and he was out of school for quite a period of time then so you know just trying to keep him together you know and without harming himself or others or getting into shit <laughs> sort of yeah be my main focus and then getting yeah. him into school I've literally just broken. <laughs> I've had my little laying on the sofa and not being able to talk or do anything to, right, I'm ready now. So now I want to start looking at doing things for me, finding out who I am, you know, what I like again, you know, just trying to fill me up with the good stuff, basically. Mm. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. We have to work on ourselves, you know. Yeah. Um, often we throw ourselves into our families, um, you know, and yeah. it's just not always helpful for the family because you end up being a grumpy bastard half the time. But yeah, um, you know, we, we have to work on ourselves because if we don't, then we um, yeah we just we 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 not clean, we dry, yeah. and, and there's a massive. Di they're two sides of the same coin but they're yeah. very different um you know. yeah brilliant what a story um i've left shit loads out but <laughs> i've just remembered stuff now which i could have said but i hope that was all right <laughs> that, that was brilliant i mean perhaps we'll do part two um yeah, when you're ready. the stuff I should have remembered. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't always remember, you know. I've I've done live uh, live chats um, <laughs> with other people, and I think, oh, I should have said that. Should have said that. Yeah. Have said that. It, you know, we 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 forget. Um, you've held yourself very well. You've done really really well. Um, Thank you. We're all really proud of you. Um, Bless you. And keep you it are up. sweetie. Um, Thank you. I'm going to cut the feed now. You stay on the line and we'll just have a quick okay, chat. Okay, cool. Like I do um, with everybody else just to make sure that everything's Thank fine. You. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Um, I don't currently have a guest booked for next week, um, but Any I'm working on it. <laughs> so um, I will get back to you when I can. Um, thanks for tuning in, as always. Uh, thanks to my sponsors, as always. Um, and I shall see you again really soon and cheers guys bye